Welcome to Adventures in Life. I'm Earl Beecher, your host. Today our guest is Harry Strong, and Harry is the Executive Campus Director of the Concord Career Institute. I want to say call it Concord College. You told me it was an institute, Harry. What, what's the difference here? What's going on? Well, an institute is a training uh, Oops. facility, facility that yeah. uh, uh, offers the programs, but it's not degree granting. However, oh, it's not degree granting. It's not up to this point in time. We're in the so process. So it's called an institute? It's called an institute. If it doesn't offer a degree granting status, it's called an institute. Well, what do you get if you don't get a degree? You get a diploma. What's the difference? <laughs> well, one, you know, a, a degree has, uh, well, basically, a degree, associate degree or bachelor's degree has general education requirements. Yes. Within it, where a diploma program has strictly the product, like for medical assistant, would learn only medical assistant courses throughout the program without any general education. But it's called a diploma, not a certificate. Correct. Correct. It's called a diploma. Okay. Now, Concord Career Institute. Right. What kind of careers? Well, we offer five programs at our school currently. We offer vocational nursing, uh, respiratory therapy, medical assistant, dental assistant, and insurance coding and billing specialist. Insurance coding and billing. Insurance is getting to be so important. You go to the hospital and they say, are you insured? That's true. <laughs> I'm barely breathing. Get me in, you know. <laughs> well, I think what people don't understand, and I've found out by offering the program, is that uh, there are 65,000 codes in the insurance coding nomenclature. 65,000. 65,000 codes. And my daughter, uh, who broke her ankle last November, uh, got a chance to see two things. I got to see a respiratory therapist administer his techniques with her while he was putting her out what they called a conscious sedation. He had to be there to put her out. A conscious, that's, conscious that's sedation. That's almost an anomaly here. Yeah, it is. Yeah, well, they put you out for about 10 or 15 seconds so they can set the bone Oh, and before they how, go to surgery. How, how do they put you out 15 seconds? Well, they, they bring the, they bring the uh, anesthesiology <laughs> and, and they, oh. they administer a a, uh, Something that just very for brief. about ten or fifteen seconds, and the respiratory therapist has to be present to monitor the breathing so that the breathing stays constant. But they only needed fifteen or twenty seconds for the surgeon to set the leg and then splint it, and then they prepare the patient for surgery. So I got to see that happen with the respiratory therapist. But once I started seeing the bills come from the various departments at the hospital and clinics, then I fully understood why coding is so important. The because, insurance thing. Because they go by codes now. If you don't understand what codes are, it's very difficult to know what you're being charged for. I see. So it does take special training to deal with it. Take special training. I want you to explain for me and the viewers why the need for this institute, because I understand there's a real shortage of m medical help that's true, primarily in the nursing area. I've heard there's a real shortage of nurses. Primarily, but I think it, as far as the medical uh, allied health programs out there it, today, the Department of Labor came out with a study through 2008 saying that the fastest 30 occupations through 2008, half of those, over half of those will be in the allied health field, in which medical assisting and The dental, fastest, growing fastest growing occupations for the next few years. Five to six years, yeah. Twenty percent plus. They're all going, they're going to be representative in the, the medical That's health correct. field. That's yeah. correct. And we are an aging population. I mean, the yeah. aging population is driving most of that. But California in particular is a growing, I mean, the state is growing by leaps and bounds. And that population is oh, getting yeah. older. Yeah. And so I think we're strategically well set in Concord, especially, or any allied health training programs in Southern California because of the need is so great and the shortage primarily in the nursing area is so great. And I think last January they came up with some new ratios that improved the, the ratio between uh, nurse and patient, made it smaller. So again, the, so you get more attention. You get more attention because there was cases where one nurse maybe had 45 patients on her ward. Oh no. So the it's kind of a double whammy. You have a shortage of nurses. People are sick and, and one nurse for 45. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. This was on her ward. 
Are all of your people ultimately trained to work in a hospital setting or nursing home or, or clinical retirement, retirement home, home or what? That's correct. They, it's not all hospital. It's not all hospital. It depends on, uh, because our program is structured such that it covers the areas of clinical and uh, elderly manner, um, doctors, clinical office. I mean, there's a, there's a variety of areas that the, that the students are trained in outside what they learn in the classroom from the theoretical standpoint. Mm -hmm. Well, now there'd be a difference in working in the hospital except in the records division, I would suppose, and working in a private doctor's office. Correct. And you're training people for both? Or, well, is, or do you actually differentiate, or is it just a general background that's well, applicable? For instance, a medical assisting program teaches both front office techniques and back office te techniques. Okay. And I think if everybody's gone to a doctor, I, I would assume everybody watching the program and you and I have both been to a doctor's office, there is need up front for the front office to take the information. Yeah. They're more stenographic, stenographic needs. and then correct. there's the gal who comes in and takes blood. Takes the blood and does <laughs> the EKGs and so yeah. we, we kind of differentiate it between front and back office but our program covers both. So the student goes to apply for a position or works in an externship, they get experience both in the front and back office and sometimes they find out at that externship which one they like better or seem to flourish in. I see. Some of them don't like the um, the blood and the urine part. Right. They'd rather work up front with people. So it gives them a chance to kind of see where, where they'd be most comfortable. Some of us were not cut out to serve <laughs> in the operating room. That's correct. But after watching CSI and Law and & Order and all of the films today, <laughs> we're all coron <laughs> coroner's <laughs> assistants. I mean, That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> yeah, but uh, our students get a chance to see that. In, uh, and dental assistant, we've all been to dentists, the Th same thing. This is way off the subject. All right. But I just want to ask this. Has there been an increased interest in your field because of all the, the gory things we see on television all the time, that young people are more aware of the need? I haven't seen any anecdotal you know, you evidence. You haven't seen anything no, that showed it. that shows that. We've always had a lot of interest and a lot of demand for that program, uh, no matter in Southern California or any of the other states that I've worked at that had those programs. What are the students' uh, qualifications to enter your program? What, what do you need? Well, we have two now because now we are degree granting for the respiratory therapy program. Oh, some of the programs, One are, of the programs yeah. are becoming... We have, we applied, so you'll be a college soon. We'll be a college as soon as we uh, apply to the accrediting board and to the state licensing. Okay. Because now respiratory therapy is an associate degree program. So to be that, you have to be degree granting. Yes. So one of our programs out of the five currently is degree granting. The other four programs... Now, to be granted the degree, is that a two-year or a four-year study? Uh, it's, it's not really a length in time. You make application. You cover so many units or so, so many, many courses. And or? they go through, and, you, and after completing the first round of courses, then they've come in make a site visit, and then after that they determine whether to grant you a degree granting or not. Okay, now are usually your, your courses like worth three credit units? Is, uh, we're, do we're you speak in those terms? Uh, it's credit, there are credits, we have so many credits. We used to be on clock hours in the old, old days, but now okay. we're on credit hours. But for instance, our nursing program is on a quarterly system. Okay. There are four, for the day program, there are four 12-week quarters, so it's a one-year program. Okay. And in those four quarters, they start off uh, with basic nursing needs and part of their clinical experience is in a manor home to work with the elderly. So there's a lot of, of, of they're equal 12-week courses, but they have different credit loads within there. And the, the time of theoretical and, the, and laboratory varies as the program continues on. And they eventually get to... to uh, Pediatrics in the fourth term, they get to death and dying, they, you know, which is, we're talking earlier about um, today, a nurse today has to know more than just the theoretical part and know the, the part about being a nurse because there is a bedside manner or there is a... She needs people skills. People skills, which is hard, I think, for, for some, a lot of younger people to learn and understand that. So uh, that's right. another thing within our program that we're, that we're currently addressing and teaching to the students is the fact that they have to have those skills also. How can you teach a person those skills? I don't know if you can teach someone to do that. I think you can expand on them. I think you, you're either a people person or you're, or you're not. And I think one of the things we try to do in the beginning 
is besides the testing, the standardized testing that, that takes place, we also do a interview with the program chair. And during that discussion, we generally find out the person is a caring person. Or if they're in it, just say, you know, we want it because we're going to make so many dollars an hour. You find out what their motivation and their commitment is up front. And I think you can tell in the first 15, 20 seconds with meeting anyone whether they are caring or passionate. And that's something you can't test with standardized testing. No, I want to get back with okay. you in a minute. We're going to take a break shortly. Okay. And I want to get back with you what standardized testing you use to help guide a student as to where you, they would probably be most successful okay. within the program, emphasizing paperwork or lab work or working with people. or yeah. Well, in our uh, like nursing program, the vocational nursing program, they take a standardized test in the beginning just to test three sets of skills which is reading, comprehension, and mathematics. Oh. And mathematics especially is very important because of the fact of uh, dosage calculation. You want to oh, <laughs> yes, uh, yes. You want to okay. make sure that uh, a nurse can calculate the doses primarily. So again, we want to make sure we measure for that set of skills. Okay, uh, we're going to go to a public service announcement. Okay. So stay with us. We'll be right back with Harry Strong. Welcome back. Our guest is Harry Strong. He is the director of the executive, executive. campus director. Correct. I got that right. You got that right. Okay. Yes. Of the uh, Concord Career Institute. Harry, uh, you're at a particular campus. Yes, we're at the Garden Grove location. The Garden Grove location is on Garden Grove and Euclid That's in correct. the city of Garden Grove. Right, it's on the corner. In the, and uh, almost everybody knows that building. I mean, it does stand out. It's a, I don't know if, it, if it's a yellow or a light color yellow. It's sort of a yellow green. A little green. It's, it's very right next pretty to, color. Right next to the McDonald's. If you find the McDonald's, you oh, find Oh, well, everybody can find that. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Okay. Now, and is this um, a one campus, or are you part of a bigger organization? How... How is it organized? We, we are one of, of 12 campuses that's owned and operated by Concord Career Colleges out of Mission, Kansas. And we have 12 locations across the United States, four of them in Southern California. We have a San Diego campus, the Garden Grove campus where we're at. We have the San Bernardino campus and the North Hollywood location. So we have four campuses in uh, California. We have three campuses in Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Jacksonville, and Tampa. Mm -hmm. We have a campus in Memphis, Tennessee, Kansas City, Missouri, uh, Arlington, Texas, Denver, Colorado, and Portland, Oregon. So there are 12 total. So there's 12 total. Yes. But uh, Southern California seems to be a hub of activity here. Is it? Well, we've got the population. We here. have the population, and uh, it's a, a great area, especially for medical allied health programs. I mean, uh, California is a very growing state with a, with a great need for allied health programs. And have you, well, with the statistics, I'm sure yep. you, you're on top of some of these, aren't a lot of the elderly people going to Florida and California to settle and that's one of the reasons there's more need for medical? You're starting to see a lot of migration from the northern and midwestern states towards the Sun Belt, as they call it, right. Texas, Florida. Uh, Arizona, California. I think California is a little more difficult because of the cost of living here in California. Ooh, I just, found that out when I moved recently. from Florida. Uh, it was kind of an eye-opener when I moved from <laughs> Tallahassee, Florida, <laughs> Southern California. But I think that slows a lot of migration for not only the elderly, but I think for the young people because it's, it's not affordable for them to actually move to Southern California. So, I don't really know enough to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things now they're a vocational nurse. Yes. How's that differed from a registered? I've heard of RNs, registered nurses, but I don't. Okay. A, well, it starts off, I guess, the, the bottom of the food chain okay. would be a certified nursing assistant. Certified nursing assistant. assistant. Do you train people for that we level? We do not. We do not. We do not train that. We start out the licensed vocational nursing. And I say vocational nurse because they're not a licensed vocational nurse until they, one, graduate from our school, yes. and two, pass a standardized uh, board test given by the state of California. If a person were to go to your school full time, how long does it take them before they are licensed, uh, you know, before they complete the training necessary? Realistically, it, it's 12 months for our day program. We have both a day and a weekend program at our campus. 
and the day program is for someone that can go to school for a year during the daytime for straight and then once you graduate in 12 months then you are able to sit before the board and it usually takes now about two to three months for the application time the fingerprinting all the preparation work, application work, before they schedule a time where you can take your test. When you say the board, what board are we talking about? It's the uh, California Board of Nursing, which governs our program. That has nothing to do with the running of your school at all. They're just people who are in the profession they, who see that you qualify people properly. True, and I think they're more on a consulting basis where they, you know, we use them as a consultant to, you know, to ask them for direction and guidance on training of nurses and, and we go before them to require classes. For instance, we are authorized to have so many nursing students start our program every year. And to change that, we would have to go before the nursing board and request additional slots. Oh, really? Yes. I didn't know that there was a limit. There is. There's a limitation of nurses. Now, you came here. No wonder there's a nursing shortage. Well, it's kind of a, yeah. It's now, kind of wait a, a minute. <laughs> well, it's, it's true. It's, there's a nursing shortage, but there's also a, a ceiling, I guess, as, so to speak, on, what, on how many we can train in our pro And to do that, you have to identify enough clinical sites. That you can't train as many as you want, and if you don't have the clinical sites to send them out to, then... Yeah, you can't do the program. So do you guarantee your students a, a job if they finish the program? I'll be honest with you that the word guarantee is not a word that should be used in any school like ours because there, there's no guarantees in anything in life if you ask me. Not anymore. No. But if a student goes through, for, I'll give you an example. If a student goes through our program th recently, graduates, and our last class that graduated was at the end of December of 19, or excuse me, 2004. Mm -hmm. And that particular class took their test in the first quarter of 2005. Yes. And the results came back in April, and 91.8% of those students that took the test in the first quarter got their license. They got their license and a job? And, well, once you get your, well, if you know the nursing shortage in Southern California across the United States, once you have that license. You, there, there's something drastically wrong if you can't find work. I see. So if you pass, the, the key, the harder of the two, I believe, is the board pass. The jobs are there. I think the students have to focus but on But you've got to be qualified. I mean, you're dealing with people's lives when you're Correct. out there. And well, the state of California has certain standards, too, uh, about completion and placement rates. Are, are the requirements in the state of California different? from the requirements of the state of Florida. You Absolutely. mentioned you moved here. Are things stricter here, looser here, what? They are very strict here. Are the people in Florida in your program getting exactly the same training, for example, that you have here, the same courses required and so forth? The curriculums are similar. I wouldn't say they're identical, but they're similar. But they report to different boards. Florida has a totally different nursing board. But they, there's an old saying when I moved here, is that if you pass the boards in California, you, you can pass any board in the United States. You can go anywhere. anywhere. Yeah, and they're very strict. There. So California does have a good strict reputation. Very well, very well known across the United States for passing, and their, their licensing is very strict. Now, the five fields, again, are? Medical system. Now, how does that differ from, from nurse? Well, medical system works primarily in an entry-level position in a doctor's office or a clinical site. Wouldn't necessarily work in a hospital setting. Okay. Okay. And they usually work front or back office. and uh, So it isn't really proper to call everybody in the doctor's office a nurse. That's correct. Yeah. There's, there could be a medical assistant up front. There could be a, a medical receptionist that greets you. There mm -hmm. could be a medical biller that's doing the coding. There could be a registered nurse that's doing the blood and your... Mm -hmm. Or it could be a phlebotomist, for that matter. I mean, some of the hospitals have people that all they... They're called phlebotomists because all they do is draw blood. But a and nurse has all the Phlebotomy those deals with the blood. Drawing the blood, yes. I see, okay. So there are specialties within a doctor's office, and depending on how large the office is, the one I go to, my physician I go to, is a small office that has one lady that works up front. She's a medical receptionist, but she also is the front office medical. She does the height and the weight. The blood pressure? The everything. And then another who is a registered nurse does the, the vitals with EKG and urine and blood. Mm -hmm. and different things and then obviously she can do some of the uh, testing with the x-rays and the doctor but it's more it's a very small doctor's office but depending on the size and shape of the office but you don't teach people to be an RN correct we do not
That's one of the programs that we're looking at because do they have to go to a medical school, or where do you have to go to get that? No, there. Well, right now there are a couple of community colleges and junior colleges that offer the RN program. Oh, they Cerritos do. Cerritos does, I believe, in Golden West. But oh. the wait list—I don't know if you've heard this—the wait list is some of those are up to three to four years to get in. And there's still a shortage of nurses. Still nurses. <laughs> it seems to me that somebody ought to take a look at things and see if they can't begin to balance. The well, I think it's supply a, with the demand. I, mean, I was just going to mention that you know, with the economics class, that uh, there's a supply and demand issue, and obviously. Uh, the, the salaries that the nurses make today are, have escalated in time. Because and I think of a lot demand. of the, I think the demand is very strong and the supply is very short. Yes. And, but I think as a young person, knowing that you can get into that field after one year of training, I mean, one year of training, you can go out and earn a great living. I mean, working you, I mean, after one year of training, enough, you're 19, enough 20. Enough to get married and support a family. Support your family. And, and buy a house and, in California. Well, I wouldn't go as far as saying that. <laughs> no. but, uh, things are so out of control. Things are out of control. But, yeah. uh, but it, is a, it is a great vocation, uh, whether you're medical or dental. I mean, dental assistant's another great field. I think someone who loves to work with people to assist the dentist. You've been in a dentist now, chair before. Now, is there before. a difference between a dental assistant and a hygienist? De uh, very much so. An right? Hygienist, yes. Hygienist. But it's... It, Mostly in training, it's a lot longer program to get into the, and the hygienist can do certain functions that an assistant can't do. An assistant can basically assist the dentist with charting and, and the, uh, you know, using the suction and so forth, but cannot do the cleaning mm -hmm. or the polishing, cannot do some of the things the hygienist. So the hygienist today is a very specialized field, but again, uh, I believe USC has one of the biggest programs in Southern California with another two-year wait list to get in there. Mm -hmm. A two-year wait. I heard that. Again. Yeah. Well, it seems to me as if you're you're on the verge. Maybe you need to expand into some of the more advanced things that have well, these big waiting lists. One of the things that we're trying to do is look into a RN or what they call an ADON program, assistant program, because that would be the next step for our. We have about 300 nursing students at our campus that are vocational nurses. Mm -hmm. The next logical step for most of them would be to become an RN. To go on and do that. And we'd like to. It, try to do that and that's a totally different board than the board we work with with vocational nursing. I see. It's time to pause for okay. another public service announcement. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Harry Strong. We are with Harry Strong who is the director of the Concord, campus. Right. Concord, Concord Career Institute. Institute. Right. I like, I like fumbling <laughs> through that. The Concord Career Institute That's right. campus right. in Garden Grove, California. Uh, what, what final thought do we need to cover here, Harry? Well, we, before we met here today, we were talking a little bit about uh, the, the skyrocketing price of education. Oh, yes. Okay, we talked about how, you know, you talked about the housing in California. The housing. Well, everything. education, you know, education and private education especially, which we are a private school, is very expensive. And the University of Laverne, where I attended and where you taught, is it private. And by that, it's very expensive to go there. But one of the things that we do at Concord and what we stress is that we know a lot of families out there that think that they can't afford to go to a private school. Okay. And one of the things that we really work on at our school is when that student or prospective student and parents come into the school, the one thing we want them to leave before they leave that building after meeting with us, we want to let them know that there's, that we're not going to let them leave without knowing that they can afford to go to our school. We will make it affordable for them to go to our you school. You work with certain foundations or grants or whatever financial aid, so that you can Financial help aid them. payment plans. We just recently changed our payment structure where we allow a student to go as far as five years beyond graduation. In order so to they can finish, finish their finish their thing, and again, there are so many students out there that that don't feel like they can afford private education, and, and the public education system right now is is kind of a wait list situation. It's very crowded. Oh, very, yeah. It's very affordable. Yeah. Uh, you know, fifteen twenty dollars a credit hour. But again, our student can come in, go eight months in medical assisting, or twelve months in a nursing program, or respiratory therapy, and seventeen months, and be out of school and working. And working in that field. And then, if they want to continue, they can maybe do it on a part-time basis. They can do it on a part-time basis, but they get a they get a career. They don't get a job. They get a career, and that's why we're called Concrete Career Institute because they get a career that they can take with them and earn a great living for the rest of their life. 
Well, I have been to your building, of course, because I'm teaching in Correct. the same building for Laverne. Correct. But I noticed the young people coming through, and they look like they, they have a purposeful look, <laughs> if I can say it. It's like they're enjoying what they're doing. I think you can t tell indirectly if someone likes what they do, and I think you being a professor, you know if the light goes on or not yes. in the classroom. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's one I, of the joys when you see. <laughs> when you see they got it. And I right. think when our students walk in, but I think that comes from our faculty and our staff, too, because it's a trickle-down effect. I believe it comes from the top down. Well, Harry, I want to thank you very much well, for I being appreciate our guest here. Well, I appreciate you for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Good. Thank you. And I want to thank our viewing audience for joining us, too. And please join us soon again for more Adventures in Life. <laughs>